So thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I, uh, my day job now is at uh, Geisinger Medical Center where I made a recent move from uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital and uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, but today, uh, as uh, was said, I'm uh, representing the American College of Physicians. John Tucker uh, has been involved in uh, preparing this presentation along with me, but unfortunately he couldn't make it today due to family reasons. Um, so the, uh, the ACP, the American College of Physicians, is, uh, is very interested in this area uh, and very dedicated to uh, building collaborative uh, efforts and uh, meeting the needs of their membership. So uh, with that, I'll say that uh, for my talk, I want to uh, just show you a few uh, introductory slides and then talk about the description of uh, the ACP and some of the educational tools it has developed, not specifically in the area of genetics and genomics, but more broadly. Uh, and then uh, in response to uh, Gene's questions, uh, in preparation for this, uh, we started conversations within the ACP um, about what was known uh, in answer to those questions. And we realized that uh, while we had many opinions, uh, we had very little data. Uh, and so the ACP actually uh, commissioned a uh, survey specifically getting at some of these questions, which uh, I'll share with you. Um, as I said when we were preparing the survey, um, we, we had to be a little cautious for internists, practicing internists, uh, asking them what they need as far as genetics education or genomics education uh, would have been a little bit like asking uh, one of us in the uh, late 80s as to what we would want out of our email uh, accounts uh, as we start to prepare to, uh, to start doing email. So uh, most uh, internists have not been uh, thrown into this pool yet, but uh, I think it's coming soon. And uh, I always like to show this um, during talks that I give. Uh, so the number of genomes that were, have been sequenced, uh, Nicholas Wade in the New York Times uh, just a couple years ago uh, pointed out that only seven human genomes had been uh, fully sequenced at that point in time. Francis Collins, uh, speaking to us at the Brigham um, in late 2011 pointed out that uh, by the end of uh, 2012, so a time point that we've already passed now by a month, uh, the NIH alone would have completed about 73,000 genomes, that's uh, exomes plus whole genomes. Uh, and I don't know if that number uh, played out accurately or not, but it gives you an idea of the uh, uptick here. And then uh, there are people making predictions, and whether it's exactly true or not, I think it's, uh, it's a reasonable ballpark estimate that sometime in 2014, uh, the one millionth uh, person will have had their genome uh, sequenced. So it's uh, difficult to uh, pin down such a number since some of this is being done in the private sector, some of it's being done by research organizations other than the NIH, but it gives you a sense of where we're going here. And I think that uh, when I talk to clinicians, particularly practicing internists, and they point out that, you know, we don't think this is coming that quickly, I think it's hard, it's going to be hard to keep uh, these one million people out of the healthcare arena where they're going to be uh, asking their uh, providers to uh, put their whole genomes or their whole exomes in context. So we had done some uh, educational work uh, with the ACP when I was at the Brigham. Uh, this was uh, one of the courses that we put on. Uh, in the audience have uh, participated as faculty. Uh, and in 2009, we got the ACP to join in this. This was a standard sort of uh, three-day event. Uh, you come to a hotel, you pay um, probably too much money, uh, and um, you, uh, you get talked to by a number of experts in the field. These were two and a half day courses. Um, we were always struggling to get an audience. Uh, we generally uh, got uh, 100 to 200 uh, practicing clinicians to sign up for these. And when the ACP joined us in, um, in 2009, um, Steve Weinberger, uh, who's one of the vice presidents of the ACP, pointed out to me, well, you know, it is a spinach course. Uh, and I didn't know what that meant. Uh, so he pointed out that, uh, you know, genetics and genomics uh, for internists, um, when that, that's offered, most people will choose something else from the menu. Uh, a small percentage of people will take it because they think it's good for them, and only a, 
only a very small percent will actually take it because they like it. So I think that, um, I think that it played out that way. We struggled for uh, six years to really uh, make this a break-even course. Um, and uh, it went on uh, permanent sabbatical in uh, 2011. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about a course we're developing um, and we're uh, test driving right now. Uh, and this is uh, being organized in the uh, context of uh, Robert Greene's uh, CSER Awards, so that's the uh, Clinical Sequencing Awards from the NHGRI. Uh, so in that grant, we have 20 providers who have signed up to uh, enroll their patients to be randomized to whole genome sequencing or standard care. And those 20 providers are 10 uh, academic internists at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital and 10 cardiologists. And we designed... Um, a uh, primary care uh, course in genomics for those 20 uh, providers. And uh, the way that we've designed it is that there is a live uh, lecture, uh, bookending uh, four hours of self-study. And these cases are really designed to emphasize competencies, uh, as has been mentioned by many of the speakers. So we're not trying to teach content. We're not trying to make people experts in uh, pharmacogenetics or in uh, genomics, but rather giving them uh, situations where uh, they will be getting data back that they have to put in the context of care. So uh, we should have the first run through of this done in a week or two. Our hope is to uh, publish our experience uh, out of the, um, out of the uh, UO1. And then uh, within three to six months, our hope is to have uh, a, um, a derivation of this on uh, Geisinger's website uh, for, uh, for wide access for providers who are uh, getting into this area. So the American College of Physicians are familiar. Uh, it's uh, the organization for internal medicine physicians or internists. Uh, and then, of course, they have to go on and explain what an internist is for the general public. Um, so uh, essentially, it's an adult uh, care provider. Uh, the ACP has 130,000 members. Uh, it's the second largest uh, after the AMA. Um, and it's, uh, of course, focused just on one specialty. And of course, they, uh, they advocate and give information to their members. Um, interestingly, they have, uh, they have many uh, tools in their toolbox for providing CME and for getting uh, information out to their uh, constituency. So internal medicine is their uh, annual um, meeting, which is held in the spring, uh, 260 presentations. Uh, uh, unfortunately, in the past, there's been very few of them on genetics and genomics, but hopefully that's going to change in response to uh, what we tell them after this meeting. Um, they have uh, what's known as MixApp, which is, uh, which is the, uh, the self-assessment program uh, that is uh, available to uh, internists, practicing internists, as well as trainees. Uh, they have something that is called PEER, so Physician Information and Educational Resource. And this is uh, a web-based decision support tool. As you can see, there are uh, many not modules already in place uh, with plan to continue to expand this. Uh, and there are various uh, resources that are available to uh, providers uh, on their mobile devices uh, that take some of this information as well as create uh, other uh, new information. Additional um, CME opportunities within ACP, uh, some relevant to uh, genetics and genomics, of course. Uh, there are uh, ethics cases, um, which um, cover a broad variety of uh, clinical ethics touch on, touch on genetics and genomics also. There's a review course for uh, board certification, which of course motivates lots of practitioners. Uh, and then there are uh, uh, statewide uh, chapter meetings, which also have scientific programs and CME attached. A little bit about what ACP does in general regarding clinical recommendations. So they develop uh, through their infrastructure three different types of clinical recommendations, uh, clinical practice guidelines, uh, clinical guidance statements and best practice advice. So um, this is available uh, on your smartphone if you're an ACP member uh, or if you sign up. But the guidelines, of course, are uh, 
systematic uh, review of the literature, evidence-based. Um, you're familiar with these from, uh, from multiple organizations that generate these. There's guidance statements, uh, of course, regarding guidelines. Uh, and then I think this is an interesting um, product which they have, which is uh, best practice advice. So this is really trying to get into that space where uh, there may not be uh, current guidelines or enough evidence base to generate clear guidance statements, but the providers are looking for uh, information on how to take care of their patients. And I think uh, right now in the genomic space, I could see uh, some things moving right into that area. So the uh, best practice advice tool, you can see here some of the uh, best practice advice uh, documents that they've already developed. So uh, along with uh, John uh, and Arlene Weissman, who's the director of the, uh, uh, the survey uh, group at ACP, we decided to uh, survey some internists uh, about uh, genetics and genomics. This took place in uh, November and December, uh, so just a, cap a couple months ago, uh, in preparation for this meeting. Uh, so the uh, objectives uh, were, and you can see the uh, questions from Gene sort of uh, paraphrased uh, in, in this. We were uh, uh, interested in gaps in knowledge, uh, gaps in skills related to genetics. Uh, we wanted to survey them about the uh, the changes in the uh, volume uh, of genetic testing taking place. Uh, we wanted to ask them about barriers f uh, that they saw um, when they tried to incorporate genetic testing into practice. And we wanted to ask them about their uh, interest in educational programs. So the uh, ACP has a very powerful uh, sur survey uh, infrastructure. Uh, a survey was designed and sent out to 806 uh, participants uh, from the ACP. Uh, and unlike uh, myself, who gets surveys and uh, seems to delete the emails uh, in many cases, these uh, docs are uh, very responsive. And as you can see here, we got a 60% uh, survey response to this survey sent out in November and December. And this is the breakdown of the respondent. Uh, so you can see it's a, across a broad range of, um, of practice uh, experience, so from uh, trainees and recent trainees um, throughout the, uh, uh, the lifespan of a clinician here, under 40 uh, and over 55 as well as in between, uh, a broad range of uh, practice settings, uh, most commonly uh, the private practice, which is where most internists are, uh, and it included both the uh, internal medicine specialist, uh, who is a generalist, uh, if you follow me, and uh, the internal medicine subspecialist, which includes all the, uh, the ologists of uh, adult care. So uh, is their uh, knowledge adequate? Um, and you can see here uh, the response of uh, those uh, four to 500 individuals. So the percentage uh, reporting adequate knowledge in, and uh, they could answer uh, affirmatively to as many of these as they so chose. So interestingly, 60% felt that their basic uh, genetics knowledge was adequate. I don't know if um, that's been tested recently or if an independent group would agree, but uh, maybe they're telling us they don't want any more basic genetic uh, uh, teaching or uh, perhaps they are, uh, in fact, up to speed on uh, genetic principles. We, we didn't dive any deeper on that. Um, only a, a quarter or so felt that they had ad adequate knowledge in uh, the indications for uh, genetic and genomic testing and intervention. Uh, you can see that uh, three-fourths were uh, worried about uh, not being adequate as far as LC, uh, ethical, legal, and social implications for genetics and genomics, and the numbers go down from there. So understanding and explaining results, uh, when to uh, test individuals, uh, what to do with the results. Uh, they didn't have uh, a good working knowledge in general uh, about the performance and the validity of the tests uh, or which specific tests to order for a clinical disorder. And um, only 6% felt that they, uh, they understood uh, when uh, insurance would cover the genetics test. And I can tell you that we do this all the time, and uh, I don't understand that. So uh, I'm interested in learning from these 6%. And um, 
we put here at the bottom uh, some of the specific comments from the uh, survey respondents. So adequate skills related to uh, genetics and genomics. Um, again, these are those reporting adequate skills, so these are the affirmative. Um, the uh, finding the recommendations and guidelines for when to test. Um, a quarter felt they could do that, and I think that's a uh, skill that they probably apply in many areas of clinical medicine. Um, incorporating genetics into practice, you can see we're falling behind uh, below 20% in all of these categories. Um, when to test to uh, confirm a diagnosis, uh, when to test to confirm risk, um, and uh, again, confirming a suspected diagnosis using genetic biomarkers, uh, and um, which tests uh, to use to evaluate risk of developing disease. So there's a little bit of overlap here in some of the concepts, but you, you get the picture here. Uh, certainly less than a quarter of these respondents felt that they were uh, adequately prepared for most of these. So this is one that I, I didn't expect uh, much uh, action on, but uh, this is the survey response that we got. So, uh, so almost half being subspecialist versus generalist. 7% uh, of the respondents said that they'd seen an uptick, uh, substantial uptick in the uh, volume of genetic tests. 42% uh, increased somewhat. Uh, and 37% um, saying it stayed the same. They, uh, we didn't, again, dive deep in this uh, initial survey into what the same was, whether it was zero or uh, few, um, but none performed was uh, 13%. Barriers to incorporation. Uh, the cost and the reimbursement issue, again, comes up uh, large here uh, and not understanding uh, uh, how to uh, get around that tangle. Familiarity with the, uh, with the tests themselves, um, lack of evidence about effectiveness, uh, questions about uh, validity, uh, again, ethical, legal, social um, issues related to genetic testing, um, uh, anxiety or a barrier around whether the patients can understand the results, uh, about a quarter. And um, we, um, we looked into this just as, uh, as many people have, uh, looking at patients obtaining uh, testing outside of the medical system through direct-to-consumers and then bringing that to them uh, about 10 to 15 percent. So when we asked them, uh, interestingly, uh, how much time would you be willing in, uh, to spend in this area, uh, you can see that um, we're going to have a very limited amount of time for uh, busy practicing uh, internal medicine docs and internal medicine subspecialists. So uh, we have one to two hours to uh, teach all of uh, genetics and genomics competencies uh, for a uh, large percentage of the respondents uh, and then going down uh, from there with 3% uh, telling us to go away. Um, the most preferred format, um, uh, these categories uh, are a little uh, fuzzy around the edges, but uh, you can see that uh, people still like books and journals as a way to, uh, to get their uh, CME or their uh, improved knowledge. Um, a quarter still like uh, the old-fashioned uh, uh, presenter in front of the room. Uh, Self-assessment modules, uh, we didn't uh, specifically ask how these would be delivered, but in the ACP structure, many are delivered uh, through the internet. Case discussions, workshops, uh, discussions with uh, experts or leaders, and discussions with peers, as you can see, it goes down from there. Um, and sorry, I, uh, I'm not sure whether that's 37 or 47. I don't have the original data with me, and I noticed that this morning. Um, so most people, um, in this survey, wanted to get their uh, education delivered online, uh, some by print, uh, and then going down from there uh, to other techniques. And one of the problems uh, has been, uh, of course, in getting uh, people to participate is that some of the things that motivate uh, providers most to participate in uh, CME are not currently there for, uh, for practicing internists. So uh, it's not showing up on their board examinations. 
uh, and for a to a large extent, their patients are not coming in uh, and asking them uh, to interpret results or get genetic tests for them. So I think uh, that those are about to change. I, I hope that some of them uh, are. But you can see here that the things that would drive them to participate more would be CME credit, a big driver, uh, maintenance of certification, of course, um, extra reimbursement, never a bad idea. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I think that ends the survey data that I have to share with you. Um, John Tooker um, has been a big advocate for this work uh, within ACP. Steve Weinberger, uh, Patrick Alguire, and Arlene Weissman helped to prepare uh, the survey and the data that I presented to you. And with that, I think we have uh, time for questions, comments, et cetera. Uh, so we have Bruce, Rex, and Jean. And Anne Irwin. Uh, so Mike, with what you've presented and what Bob presented a few minutes ago with surveys, it's pretty obvious that at least these two groups feel ill-prepared. <clears throat> I honestly worry sometimes, though, that there has been a kind of almost, well, a negative perception in the community that this is just so dazzlingly difficult that it's a Mount Everest to climb. And I actually don't think that that's a good message for people to get. If you'll forgive me, the evolution we're talking about, we have the opportunity for it to be intelligently designed also. And the, um, I guess my hope would be to make it clear to people that you can dock what's new to what they already know. That physicians have a lot of experience, for example, dealing with ambiguity and making decisions about clinical validity. And largely the same is true here. I think we have, again, the ability to embed things in point of care decision support, and we have partners whom they can work with. And so I, I, I hope that as these various surveys are interpreted, that we try to put a positive spin on things that, yes, this is a lot is new, but it really has to be docked to what is familiar. And I think that should not be so hard to do. I think that's a great point. And in the, uh, the genomics course that we're developing, we're really trying to um, use cases where the providers will be doing a lot of what they're familiar with. Putting inf complex information into context for the patient is what they do all the time. And though they may be a little bit intimidated by genetics and genomics, it's just a different kind of, kind of data that they're going to be doing the same things with. Great. Thanks. Rex? So the survey data is really, really interesting, but I want to go back to something you talked about at the beginning of your talk uh, in terms of the fact that uh, ACP does a lot of uh, work in the clinical guidelines space. And one of the topics that's come up, it's, you know, I think virtually every one of the previous genomic medicine meetings is uh, the fact that there are relatively few clinical practice guidelines for any areas of genomic medicine. And uh, A, is it just too early for that to be, uh, for any of them to be really solidly validated, or how should we be thinking about that from your perspective? So that's a great question, and I thought it was interesting that a lot of the docs felt that they can incorporate the guidelines because there aren't any, <laughs> or very few. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, ACP has a, uh, a, a very, uh, well-organized infrastructure for generating um, guidelines. And um, it has a lot of requirements about an evidence base. Uh, and most of clinical genetics and genomics uh, does not meet the, uh, the rules for evidence-based clinical guidelines. And so we're stuck in the position of not being able to um, uh, to write guidelines that would meet the expectations of the evidence-based medicine um, group. Um, and so that's why I was particularly interested in, uh, in ACP's uh, other kind of uh, less rigorous types of guidelines to, to uh, help with practice. And uh, I can't speak for how it'll play out with an ACP, but I'm hopeful that we would be able to find uh, instances where we could get sort of that intermediary uh, ACP behind uh, certain uh, best practices uh, until we get to the point where we can write the, uh, the hard guidelines. But 
Can I just follow up on that a little bit? So, um, what process, if any, could uh, NHGRI or the broader genomic medicine scientific community be doing to advance things in the, you know, in, in your category of, I guess it would be best practice guidelines maybe, which was sort of, I think, the lower, the, the lowest bar uh, of evidence. You know, the, one of the problems we face is that for some of these things, the evidence base will forever be small because we're just not going to have a lot of examples and we're certainly not going to be able to do, you know, randomized clinical trials on a particular variant. So, uh, you know, is, is it just inevitably we'll just be at that lowest level of uh, clinical practice guideline or, or uh, best practice? Well, I, th I think maybe an idea for a future genomic medicine meeting would really be to get those practice guideline experts in the room together with, with us and start thinking about that. Uh, I mean, it's almost for a while and on many topics, we're going to have expert opinion driving best, best practice. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm not sure uh, without the, uh, the real guidelines gurus in the room whether we can sort of lay, it, lay out the intermediary steps. But I think it's a great question. I don't know if anyone else in the room has experience or uh, ideas about that. I know the cardiologist do a lot so, of guidelines. So maybe asking, so maybe asking to speak to this specific thing because we have other other folks. So we had Bill first, and then Donna. I think this is a great discussion here because uh, this is the way we're going to be able to drive some of this uncertainty of where does this field lie for the practitioner. Forget about the academic practitioner. It is the majority are in practice and they need some guide within the guidelines. Now, addressing the guidelines, obviously the IOM came in with even more rigorous uh, uh, criteria, if you will, particularly from a review process. And for our guidelines, actually, Donna is here. She's president of the American Heart Association. And our guidelines are done jointly, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. Where, where it comes is, is the rigor of the scientific background and, and the if you will, transparency and, and lack of conflict there. However, if you look at our guidelines, the vast majority are not randomized clinical trials. A lot of them are expert consensus opinion. And I think this is, so within that, uh, we're really not that limited, provided that we have clinical outcome as opposed to just testing and whether testing does really change the outcome in individuals or the way you treat them. So I think this is very important for us to address. and. Going back to at least my opinion, and we'll share that with you this afternoon, is you, we would like to embed this in the disease process. So instead of putting guidelines for genetics, it will be, if we're talking about coronary disease, if we're talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Marfan, whatever it is, where does genetic testing fit? What should you do if particularly, and, and consider different clinical scenarios, and this is where we came about with beyond guidelines as appropriateness use of where should you, in all these different clinical scenarios, where would it be appropriate to order such a test and when? So I think there is a mechanism through the guideline process to do this, and I think this is very timely. Okay, so focusing again on guidelines, we have a whole list of folks who weren't talking about guidelines. And, and let me just, Joan, yours is about guidelines too? Okay, so we'll do guidelines. Donna. Just to build on, on Bill's comments, we really don't at this moment have the evidence base in cardiovascular diseases to really develop a guideline using RCT experience. So we would be in the realm of using appropriate use criteria. So I think being that's the realm, that's where we should start. and we that will drive practice ultimately. Great, okay, so, and Ned is about guidelines too, no, but I'm not calling on you, just a minute. <laughs> so because I think we had, Alan, were you gonna talk about guidelines? No, okay. Um, so the guideline folks were, let's see, Mary, um, Joan, and someone else here, and I'm sorry, yeah. 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 and yeah. Catherine, and then Ray had a comment on, oh, and Ned, okay, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> so, so. Yeah, really. I've now I've forgotten where I was. Mary, where I, I was. Mary, was yeah, Mary, go ahead. So I think one of the things that's making genetic testing guidelines different than other guidelines that we're used to using in medical practice is this pressure 
that whole exome and whole genome and other array-based tests are being performed. So take out all of that soul searching about whether to test. And that changes the question a lot. And that's what I run CPIC, Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, with the firm GKB. And we are specifically aimed at pretend you already have the genetic information. What are you obligated to act upon for patient care? And that takes very practical clinical decisions. How serious is the disease? How serious are the adverse effects? What are the alternatives? If there's good alternatives, your threshold for, for creating an action plan based on genetic testing is completely different than if there aren't. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of guidelines are bogged down in the weather to test, and we need to get away from that because it's going to be how should you act upon the information once you already have it? Okay, so, so guideline folks, I think Catherine, Ned, uh, Joan, and possibly Ray. Okay, um, I just wanted to add quickly, anybody who's been in a room with Mewing Curry, is, this is his favorite topic, I think, of evidence um, and how much evidence we really need. And we've spent a lot of time at the IOM roundtable talking about this. One thing I think he's doing, and maybe somebody else knows more about this in the room, is convening a meeting in February um, with all of the players and evidence guideline development to talk about this very issue about how much we really need to do. We're not going to have randomized control trials and what kind of things we need to do to gather the evidence to move forward. Great point, yeah. Um, let's see, so Ned? So th that's a great segue. So um, <clears throat> I think what we may face is the fact that the methods will vary on the clinical scenario. And so a lot of work uh, for EGAP and other groups has been based on the screening scenario and the, uh, the tumor profile and the clinical scenarios that are being discussed around the table. Uh, have a different imperative day-to-day uh, -day clinical care. So I want to follow up. The reality is we have the information. We're going to have to incorporate guidelines before the evidence is available. My plea is that we don't stop there, as we have often in the history of medicine, and not fill in the gaps of evidence, and let these guidelines be evidence-based as we fill that information over time. Uh, that, I think, is the the kind of moral imperative of evidence-based guidelines, that we have to do something with the information we have now because the patient and the test are in front of us. But we need to fill in those evidence gaps and have that discipline to change those guidelines over time. Now that, that's an excellent point, Ned. And, and one of the things I think we find in the, on the research side is we don't really know you know, where are the areas that you need evidence and what kind of evidence do you need? And, and then, you know, we have to match that with our resources and being able to produce it. Um, but somehow we need to make that link a little bit tighter in, in producing it. Um, okay, so Joan? Uh, yeah, I, my comment is really a question directed to the different healthcare provider organizations who are represented here, and I realize there's a lot who are missing because usually when it gets down to the actual practice levels, um, practitioners look to their own societies for their own practice guidelines, and that's often a barrier particularly in an area like this, um, in that every organization has its old standards, its own methods, which are often several years in making to come up with the, with the guidelines. So I wonder if this is an opportunity for various um, practitioners in through different organizations to be working together around the generation of practice guidelines for um, genomics, as opposed to every provider organization doing their own. Now, again, an excellent point. I think one of the reasons we have everyone in the room, and I'm, I'm sorry we don't have a longer uh, lunch period so that we can be addressing it, but, but it will be addressed, I think, uh, uh, later this afternoon. Um, so I did see you, but uh, let me see. Anyone else about guidelines? Just one second, Mira. Ray, was your point covered? Or? As a uh, cardiologist, both a fellow of the AHA and the, AC and the American College of Cardiology, I have authored guidelines for the cardiomyopathies, genetic cardiomyopathies for the Heart Failure Society of America in 2009. It's very important. We actually discuss this issue of, of course, being a cardiologist, we expect the highest level of real evidence, and we just won't have that. So I think this topic is really key if we can make headway on what, uh, what the most appropriate evidence is, whether it's called the guideline or not. I do think there is intense interest in the cardiovascular community for this, and particularly as we move into whole genome uh, and uh, strategies for, for elite, even the, this, the Mendelian uh, diseases, uh, a lot of interest, and we, we have to address this. 
rates. So I think this will be the last guideline comment, Mira, <laughs> for the moment at least. Mira. I'd actually just like to second um, the comment about collecting outcome data because I think as, and embedding it within the disease process because if whatever the healthcare system of the future turns out to be, we're gonna have to show value. And you know, if value is outcome over cost, if, if we can actually show that the outcomes are better um, over the lifetime of a disease by doing this testing, we're gonna you know, not have to deal as much with the cost issue. Excellent point. Um, okay, so I, I wanna then go back to the other comments that have been patiently waiting, and maybe we can get the rest of them in, in, uh, uh, in the lunch period. So, so I have Jean, Pasmani, Irwin, Kate, and Alan. Were there anybody else who was waiting? And Deborah. okay, we may not get to all of these, but we'll do our best, so Jean. So here's a quick one. Did you ha see any contrast between the generalists and the subspecialists in your survey? So the, uh, the survey was too small to tease that out, but um, the plan is to actually, uh, well, we're going to discuss it in the uh, next couple of weeks, is to do a larger survey amongst the, uh, the ACP wider group with the hope of looking at that. Uh, Irwin? Yeah, uh, Mike, thanks. This is a very timely contribution. I was just wondering, you had in your list uh, of genetic testing only the kind of questions that relate to disease risk, disease susceptibility, et cetera. And uh, I was just curious whether you actually also had questions about pharmacogenetics, uh, because you know there may be a little bit of a different perception in pharmacogenetics compared to disease risk and susceptibility genetics. That's a great point, Arwen, and we didn't go after it in this initial survey, but, but we're, we're going to take back ideas to hopefully do a larger survey in the next couple months. That's a good point. Good. Thank you. Um, and uh, Kate, I think? So as someone who's an internist and internal medicine department, um, I think that uh, the uptick in referrals, and uh, Mike, you can comment on this, in the past five years has been immense. And I think that what I find is that if you have a subspecialty in particular where they start seeing one disease where they're interested in genetics, as soon as you get the one in there, then they start referring everybody for genetics. And that's, I think, partly why cancer was sort of on the front of this, because they sort of had a disease early on. But now we have pulmonary, cardiology, endocrine, every subspecialty specialty is consistently referring patients to us. And once you get in one place, you get the rest. And I think that, you know, we have more business than we could possibly handle, basically. Um, and I think that what this really speaks to is a really um, importance of identifying uh, physicians to be trained in internal medicine and in genetics, which is, um, given the dearth um, in other areas, is really even worse than certainly in pediatrics and other subspecialties. Excellent points. Um, Alan, I think you're next. Ah, there you go. Um, and Deborah, I think you're next. This is not really a question, but it's a comment from the morning's discussions, which is, could I make a plea that we stop using the word whole in front of exome and genome? Because I think that's going to be just another educational hurdle for physicians in that what we do today doesn't actually get you the entire genome or even exome sequence. So we're going to have to re-educate everybody that, and, and also that there are holes in the information, even if you have an exome or a genome, it's not getting to certain mutations, repetitive sequences, pseudogenes, th those kinds of things. And even technically, when we get to be able to do that, there are changes that won't, that are disease significant that won't be detected by a sequence. So I think if we use the term exome sequencing and genome sequencing, it's actually more accurate, and I apologize, but it, yeah. it's become a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, you, you actually missed our last meeting where Mike actually proposed that we uh, officially call it whole H-O-L-E uh, genome sequencing, <laughs> and so that is the convention that we use here, so. Great. All right. Any other uh, questions or comments on this topic? Oh, uh, okay. So, Bill, you have the last one. Uh, thank you. I. Uh, I want to make a comment and then then make a suggestion. The first comment is that I'm very impressed with the amount of survey data that are out there. I, th I think it's wonderful. We've had two or three presentations, and cardiology is going to add to that, uh, where we've actually surveyed our members and we have data. It really is really is good, and I think it speaks to the fact that we've all sensed 
holes, excuse me for using the term, um, but and, and that's the first step. I think mm -hmm. that's great. Well, it sounds like a possible publication in the making if the four of you can get together. Well, and, and actually, uh, Gene and I talked about that. I think I think that's great. Um, the other thing is that I just want to I just want to bring up a suggestion here that that I would like for folks in the room to consider going forward, not for this meeting, but as other thoughts are are pulled together and expressed. One of the one of the services that I provided to the college, our college, uh, before I came on full time was to be co-chair of the Medical Professional Liability uh, Working Group. And um, it occurred to me as I listened to these presentations that, that we've made huge technological advances in medicine, in genetics and genomics, and that whenever there are technological advances in medicine going back to the 1850s, there are substantial liability uh, increases. And so um, let's just think about that, and maybe at some point uh, it may be worth us convening a small uh, mini group to sort of pull together the experience to identify the risks uh, and begin to think about how they can be mitigated, because I think those will be, those will be helpful activities for our practitioners, for all of our practitioners going forward. It's, it's interesting in the barriers that have been identified, we almost never hear that one. And yet when you talk to people, they, they say, what do I do with this information? I'm going to be liable for it, and it doesn't come up then. Very good point. Great. All right, Mike, thank you very much. You stimulated a lot of discussion and thought. This is great. So, um, so next we're, we're hearing from Sandra Swain and Bill Powell. I think you're doing a duet uh, right. from the Society for Clinical Oncology.